Hey everyone, so uh, the last time we spoke with Dr. Rob Sivas, um, we got the introduction to his uh, innovative look at uh, diabetes understood, as he puts it. Um, this is now chapter one of that whole series that we're going to be doing. So um, as you can see, he's got a piece of paper out there. He's going to draw us all a picture. So take it away, Rob. Thanks, Doug. Uh, this is the representation I'm going to give today is exactly what I do every time when I see a new patient in my office. Um, the discussion takes the form in three parts and the next three chapters of this book will be those three parts. The way I do it is I sit down with my patients across from me and I doodle on a piece of paper as I tell a story. So what I'd like you to do is to look at the story, listen to it, read through it, follow the diagram as I draw it. Number one, keep a very open mind. Everything I'm going to discuss today clashes very heavily with the conventional understanding in the world out there about what obesity is and how to deal with obesity and diabetes. The second thing is follow each line because every line has a specific impact. Try not to connect the dots by yourself. Try not to jump ahead and draw conclusions. And the third point is keep your defenses down. Don't say, yeah, I understand that about other people and this doesn't apply to me. Keep a very open mind about this. Take this information home with you, plug it into the context of your life over the next two or three days, and then decide whether you agree that the person I'm about to describe is you or is not you. So let's launch into this. The reason why people are interested in this right now is because they come to me with one of two issues. And in fact, they have both issues because you can't have the one without the other, but one is more recognizable. The first reason why people come to see me is because of excess weight. Um, and the second reason is because of certain health issues um, of which diabetes is the most important. And many, many people out there, when they have these excess weight issues that they haven't really dealt with, kind of play ostrich with the health issues. They bury their head in the sand. They don't want to know because if you do know, you kind of have to do something about it. The other point when people first come to see me is everybody, by definition, by the time they come to see me, whether it's me or anybody else, is already an expert at failing weight loss programs. We've tried a variety of different conventional strategies to deal with uh, our excess weight, and they, we may have lost some weight, but the sustainability has just not been there. So the first understanding is, why is that the case? It isn't because we're lazy. It isn't because we're gluttons. It isn't because we haven't put effort in. Quite the opposite. We've put tremendous effort into this, but the methodology is just wrong. The standard, the standard reason or the standard rationale that the world out there follows in terms of getting people to lose weight is a conceptual theory called SECO, calories in, calories out. And what that essentially means is that when you eat excess calories to what your body needs, you accumulate weight. And when you reduce your calorie consumption and increase your calorie burn, you lose weight. And that is a very narrow and completely false premise. It is true that in order to lose weight, you have to reduce your calorie consumption. And Every theory out there that is based on a SECO principle, no matter how scientific and how plausible the explanation is, ultimately at the heart of every SECO principle is some form of formula of intentional caloric reduction that they call a diet and some form of physical activity that we use to burn off calories. So no matter what the principles are, no matter what the science is, it's always some form of diet and exercise. And while transiently, it may help you to reduce your calorie consumption and lose some weight, but there are two problems with this. Number one, fundamentally, any diet of intentional caloric restriction is a form of starvation. And in the long run, starvation is unsustainable. The human body just can't sustain that, and it rebounds. And when it rebounds, you gain the weight back. The second issue with SECO, while it addresses the weight, your excess weight is not the problem. Your excess weight is the result of the problem. And unless you can understand the cause, why you gained the weight in the first place, you're never effectively going to keep the weight off. The way I look at obesity, my vision of obesity is like a polluted river. You can go down to the river and take the crap out of the river every single day and have a clean river for a day. But until you shut down the factories that are putting the crap in the river, you're never effectively going to keep that river down. So we need to empty the river, but we also need to stop 
the river from becoming polluted. Now, one of the benefits I have as a surgeon who does obesity surgery, and whether this is excess weight or diabetes, it's kind of the same thing, as I'll explain to you in a second. But what we see in surgery is very, very dramatic, very rapid caloric reduction and weight loss. So I have the benefit of having the single best diet that exists in, in uh, um, the human world. I do surgery. My weapons, my tools are bands, balloons, sleeves, bypass. Those are the weapons that I can use to force you to lose weight. And I've learned a lot by, having, by helping people with this. But here's the key thing about surgery. Surgery is just the most powerful diet out there. And this is what most surgeons won't tell you. The first step is this, that any of these devices, any of these surgeries will definitely result in massive weight loss. However, the durability of that weight loss is not forever. The effective durability of weight loss after any of these surgeries is around six months to three years. In fact, it's probably only two years. However, and, and, and the only time that people lose more weight after three years is if there's a complication from the surgery. What happens after about two, three years is most people end up gaining their weight back. So even the surgery is just like another big fail diet. However, some people are unable because of the surgery to eat adequately. And therefore, for example, with gastric bypass, 100% of those people will go on to develop some form of malnutrition. And I'm radical enough, even as a surgeon, to tell you that I do not believe gastric bypass should be done in a human being as a first operation, as a rescue, as a second or a third operation, perhaps. But because of the malnutrition and because the weight loss is no different with these other surgeries in the long term, I believe that that is... Um, uh, that that is a problematic surgery because of the problem, because of the complications and the long-term weight regain and malnutrition. The goal is to lose the weight with whatever caloric restriction or surgical tools that you use, but then during that time to address the cause so that hopefully with a few speed bumps, you remain normal. And it's this that's the case. So, for example, if you're a smoker and you've tried to quit and failed to quit several times, there's no harm to using Chantix as a way to get you to, to, to um, be better at not going back to smoking the next time. That's how these, these, these surgeries and possibly some dietary restrictions should work. There is value to them, but as a tool to help you to address the cause, not as a replacement for addressing the cause. So that's an important consideration because you're going to get misinformation about SECO and you certainly are going to get misinformation about surgery. So having said all of that, let's talk about cause. Because if you effectively treat cause, vicariously you're going to lose the weight and keep it off. So if you can effectively address the cause, you really don't need to engage in these things. They happen automatically. Because there's so much confusion and so much ambiguity about the cause of obesity, for a little while here, I'm going to use an analogy. I'm going to use an example that has nothing to do with obesity or diabetes. What we're going to talk about here is something that our society understands completely. A five-year-old can give you this information. So let's talk about all the liquids that human beings can drink. Our society has clearly divided the liquids that human beings can drink into two distinct categories. On the first hand, we've got water and water-like substances that we have to drink for hydration. Okay, So that forms part of our nutrition system, and that is a vital system. Without water or water-like substances, we die. However, our relationship with water is very, very tightly controlled by the thirst center. And this has happened since we've been a species. So when you're thirsty, you don't know how much water you're going to drink. You start drinking water, and as soon as your thirst is quenched, it might be half a bottle, one bottle, two glasses, three glasses. It doesn't matter. But as soon as your thirst is quenched, a signal goes from your stomach to your brain that says, hey, I'm done, and you stop drinking. Now, could you drink some more? Sure you could. But there is zero incentive to drink more water because your thirst is quenched and therefore the thirst center very tightly controls this relationship and bad things don't happen. On this side of the equation, I'm going to put another liquid that we drink. That's called alcohol. Now, while alcohol is a liquid that we drink, nobody in their right minds are going to tell you that we drink alcohol because of hydration. The reason we drink alcohol is for pleasure. So alcohol is one of the things that is a powerful endorphin activator. 
And the endorphin system is as important as the nutritional system, but distinct and separate. So alcohol is a drug. By definition, drugs are things we consume primarily for the high, for the buzz, for the pleasure effect, number one. Number two is alcohol is not necessary for human survival. You can survive without alcohol. You really can't survive without water. And thirdly, as mentioned, you can drink alcohol to excess and excess over time will cause harm. Nobody drinks water to excess and therefore this issue of harm doesn't happen with water. But I'm not saying alcohol is bad. I drink alcohol and I value my alcohol consumption tremendously because alcohol is a very, very effective, positive tool to help us to deal with certain emotional needs. All human beings have certain emotional needs. And after a rough day or while watching a sport event, having a beer, having a glass of wine is a very effective, healthy way to dissipate certain of these emotional needs. We all have feelings. We all have anxiety, stress, depression, ang uh, anger, fear, sadness, boredom, pleasure. And that glass of wine, that beer, that cocktail, very effective and healthy at dissipating that. No harm there. However, if you begin to use alcohol more and more and more, no longer just to dissipate these feelings, but now to numb, soothe, and obliterate these feelings, over time, that chronic excessive relationship begins to cause harm. You get DUIs, you get liver disease, you start losing your job, you lose your friends and your family and your relationships. And if you ignore or distort the reality of the harm to continue the relationship, you've lost control of the relationship. You're an alcoholic. Everybody understands that. So an alcoholic is somebody who has a substance abuse problem. Everybody's in agreement with that. Everybody understands the biologic ramifications of excess alcohol. However, the, the issue that most people don't understand about alcohol, alcoholism is that it is based upon a dysfunctional emotional management system. So here's the key concept. Alcohol, alcoholism does not cause a dysfunctional emotional management system. It's the paucity or the absence or the effective absence of an emotional management system that allows people, when they come into contact with alcohol, to drink it excessively. So there are some people that, that are prone to be a vulnerability to addictive behavior, and they're more likely to become alcoholics. Others aren't, and therefore they're less likely to become alcoholics. But by definition, every alcoholic has a dysfunctional emotional management system because the problem with an alcoholic is not alcohol. I drink alcohol. The problem is the relationship. And the relationship is because of an ineffective emotion management strategy. So for me as a physician, when I treat an alcoholic, the most difficult part about treating an alcoholic is the concept of ownership. There are plenty of people out there that everybody in this country knows have a drinking problem. They're alcoholics. And the only person that doesn't understand it or know it or acknowledge it is the person themselves. Oh, no, 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 no. That DUI was just a mistake. I got this. I'm in charge of this. I'm in control. As long as the alcoholic believes they're in control of their drinking, they are going to continue to give themselves permission to drink. Now, nobody gets drunk on one beer. You can have one beer, you're absolutely fine. So the problem is not one beer. The problem is once an alcoholic grants themselves permission, once they cross that threshold of permission to drink, you combine that permission with an unexpected emotional event and their only emotional management defense is to continue drinking and they get drunk again and the problem continues itself. So any addiction is dealt with through the concept of permission and the absence of permission leads to abstinence from the drug itself. Nobody just uses heroin on Tuesdays. Nobody just smokes two cigarettes a day. So trying mm. to restrict the relationship is just not effective because you've lost control. So once the alcoholic humbly, with a great degree of humility, acknowledges that they have an out-of-control relationship with alcohol, then you can begin the tough process of working toward abstinence. But abstinence is not enough. Abstinence is not enough because now you've left the alcoholic with no way to deal with their emotional needs. So in addition to quitting drinking, you have to help the alcoholic to develop a diversity of what I call endorphin alternatives, other ways to dissipate the emotional need, but in a more effective way. Because 
when the alcoholic drinks, they numb, soothe, and obliterate the feeling, but they never, ever really connect. In fact, quite the opposite. They suppress the tough emotional issues that are driving these feelings. So, for example, if I've had a rough day at work and I've had a fight with a colleague and I feel terrible about it, and I come home and I'm miserable and I saddle up my, my, my dog and I take my dog out for a walk, that walk is a wonderful endorphin relaxing experience. But during the walk, because there's a time continuum, I can think about what happened at work today and I can come to terms with the issue. So the walk dissipates the emotion, the stress and the, and the anxiety and, the, and uh, the feelings I've had. But at the same time, I'm able to process the tough emotional issues. And by the time I come back from the walk, I'm feeling relaxed and I've got a mechanism for dealing with that issue. If I'm an alcoholic, I have a fight with a colleague at work, I come home, I drink a bottle of Jack Daniels and I pass out, I've obliterated the feelings, but I've disconnected and repressed the issue. So I really have an ineffective way to deal with those emotional needs. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So now what has that got to do with obesity? Well, an obese person or a diabetic is identical to an alcoholic, except the drug is different. I would tell you that 80 plus percent of the calories that an obese person or a type 2 diabetic consumes is actually a drug, not food. And I'm going to make a statement here. I'm going to prove the statement to you. It is impossible to get fat or become diabetic from eating food. You see, food by definition is the, are the substances that we have to eat for, for a, from a nutritional perspective without which we will get sick and die. And as human beings, our relationship with food is very tightly controlled by the hunger satiety center. And nobody overeats just because. So if you're hungry, you start to eat real food. And as soon as you're full, a signal goes from your stomach, from your fat cells in your stomach to your brain that says, hey, I'm done. I'm full. So if I put a massive steak in front of you or a huge salad in front of you, you'll start eating. As soon as you're full, your stomach says, I'm done. And you quit eating even if there's more in front of you. But there is no stopping point for the consumption of this drug. Just like alcohol, the incentive is always to do more. And in fact, the, the, the problem with this drug is that in 1977, the, um, f the FDA, not the FDA, the USDA implemented or inserted this drug as what they called a necessary part of our food chain of our food pyramid. So they took the drug and made it food when that is false. This drug is not food. We consume it primarily for pleasure. It is not necessary for human survival. In other words, if we never ever ate it again, we'd be absolutely fine. And we can eat it to excess and excess causes harm right there. The excess weight and the diabetes are the harm it causes. What is that drug? That drug is sugar and starch. It is carbohydrates. And I think the key concept is to understand that carbohydrates do not belong on the nutrition or the food side. They belong on the drug and endorphin side of this equation. And once we separate those two out, we can then deal with our relationship with carbohydrates like we are dealing with our relationship with alcohol, crystal meth, crack cocaine, heroin, and now marijuana, as well as nicotine. The problem here is a substance abuse problem. And all of these things are in effect. So someone who is obese or diabetic, primarily at the underlying part of all of this, has a dysfunctional or an ineffective emotion management system that has resulted in chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption to the point of harm and ignoring the harm to continue the relationship. And the problem with carbohydrates is they're so effective at numbing, soothing, and obliterating these feelings that we remove or reduce or do not activate the endorphin alternatives because this is so darn good. It's far nicer to sit and eat a tub of ice cream at night when you've had a rough day than to take your dog out for a long walk. So we, we increase in a positive supply our relationship with carbohydrates. In addition, it's not just the carbohydrates, it's the pattern with which we, we eat. The endorphin system requires activation about every 15 to 20 minutes. So snacking, is always an emotional event, never a nutritional event. We should be eating once or twice a day for the nutritional value. But we're eating 6, 8, 15, 20 times a day. We're putting crystal meth in our mouths. 
So it's not just the carbohydrates, it's the frequency as well. And both of these two things lead to the obesity and the diabetes, depending on your body's ability to produce insulin that we'll talk about next time. But this is really the problem. And the issue with obesity is a permission and a substance abuse problem, not a calorie problem. And here's why the um, traditional diets and exercise programs break down. Because by definition, every diet program is asking you to control a relationship that you've already lost control of. What Weight Watchers does is it assigns points that you can accumulate and you save up all your points so that when you've lost a significant amount of weight, you can reward yourself with a piece of cheesecake. That's as ridiculous uh, as, uh, it's as ridiculous, yeah, as, as an alcoholic celebrating a year of sobriety with a case of beer. Totally. It's Just not as bad. possible to do that, right. So the two, the two problems we have with the SECO um, philosophy is that they indiscriminately assign this to all forms of calories. Yes, if you go on the cookie diet, you can lose weight because it's calorie reductive, but it's not getting addressing the cause. And of course, you're going to go back to eating more uh, and, and break down. The second thing that the SECO diet doesn't address at all are the emotional alternatives. In fact, they use physical activity as a punitive way to lose weight, to burn calories. Well, you tell any 300-pound or obese person to go and exercise, they're miserable. But the machine says they burnt 1,000 calories. So what makes them feel better? A tub of ice cream that's only got 50 calories in it. <laughs> so, so we use uh, exercise as a way to reward ourselves with a very drug that caused the problem in the first place. Hmm. And, and those are all the concepts we have to get away from. So really what I've sketched out today is the carbohydrate addiction model of obesity and diabetes. Now, if you get rid of the carbohydrates, which we really want you to do, that leaves two deficits. It leaves a food deficit. In other words, if I'm not going to eat carbohydrates, what should I be, should I be eating? What biologically and physiologically and historically does my body need to be optimal from a food perspective? And we'll address that next time I, we talk in the next chapter. However, when you remove the carbohydrates, you're also removing your dominant, if not exclusive, endorphin-releasing mechanism. So at the same time, we have to help you to develop a more effective emotion management system. And we've got to discuss what those endorphin alternative categories are for human beings. What are we programmed to use from an endorphin perspective without really effectively causing us harm? And we want to go from using substances toward doing things that have a time component of emotional dissipation, as well as the processing of the underlying issues. And this is chapter three of this discussion. So today's discussion was all about the carbohydrate addiction model. And if you want to prove to, if you're obese or have two type, type two diabetes, but you don't buy into this, keep an open mind, go home over the next two to three days and look at three things. Number one, look at how often you're putting something in your face. I don't care if it's a piece of chocolate, if it's an apple, if it's a meal, just look at how often, and remember, we should be eating once or twice a day. We typically feed our dogs once or twice a day. That's how often we should be having calorie-consuming events. And just look at how often that is. I don't care if it's one M&M or the whole bag. Look at how often you're doing it. It's probably going to be in the 15 to 20 uh, times a day uh, uh, ballpark. Whether it all happens at night, whether it happens during the day and the night, examine that. The second thing I want you to look at is what is the calorie makeup of what you're eating? And I, my prediction is at least 80% of the calories you're consuming are carbohydrates. And again, this is where the seeker world is wrong. What is healthier for you, an apple or a bowl of ice cream? Clearly the apple is, that's what the world tells us. Well, guess what? An apple has more calories, more carbohydrates in it than a bowl of ice cream. So while a glass of red wine may be healthy, healthy for me, because I'm not an alcoholic, if you're an alcoholic, it doesn't matter how healthy a glass of red wine is, the alcohol is the problem. An apple may be healthy for a skinny person, but for me or my obese or diabetic patients, it doesn't matter how many nutrients are associated with the carbohydrates. It's the carbohydrates that are the problem. It doesn't matter what goes in your face. What matters is what goes into your bloodstream. And whether you consume an apple or whether you consume ice cream, they have about the same or slightly higher on the apple side amount of sugar that's entering your bloodstream that is giving you 
the crystal meth high that you seek from that carbohydrate. So we've got to distinguish carbohydrates irrespective of how they've been sold to us and pitched to us by the world out there. So the first thing is look at how often you're putting something in your face, look at the carbohydrate content of that. And then the third question is, why am I eating this right now? Why am I drinking this right now? Am I really thirsty? Am I really hungry? Or is this as a result of some emotional need? And remember, boredom is emotional need. I've just had dinner. Why am I sitting here eating a bowl of ice cream? Why am I looking in the fridge an hour after dinner for some snack? Why have I woken up in the morning not hungry, but I'm eating a bowl of cereal? Mm. We're not hungry in the morning. Those are responses to our emotional needs, not our nutritional needs. So when an obese person or a diabetic says, oh, I'm hungry, how often do you desire a cigarette if you don't smoke? Never. How often does a smoker desire a cigarette? About every 20 to 30 minutes. And the reason for that is because they, nobody needs a cigarette. Nobody desires a cigarette. But a cigarette delivers to a smoker nicotine, and nicotine is a very powerful endorphin-releasing uh, um, chemical. So about every 20 minutes, the smoker needs an endorphin-activating mechanism they need their nicotine. The cigarette is the delivery system for that nicotine. Guess what? I need a cigarette. Well, when an obese person or a diabetic says, oh, I'm hungry, but they've just eaten or they haven't, they, they've eaten sometime during the day, they're not hungry nutritionally. Their bodies aren't looking for food. Their brain is looking for an endorphin high. And hunger for a fat person is typically an emotional event, not a nutritional event. So we've got to transform our way of thinking from a, from a diet perspective to a substance abuse effect, uh, perspective. And if this resonates with you, then you might say, yeah, you know what? I'm in complete agreement with what you've said, but I don't care. I love my carbohydrates. I don't care if they make me fat or harm me. I can't help that person. Because once you acknowledge that this is who you are, the next question is, are you willing to try to kill your best friend? Because your best friend is trying to kill you. Okay? If you decide, I'm going, to kill carb I'm going to get rid of carbohydrates, you are absolutely going to fail. Nobody, nobody can just crumple up the carbohydrates and throw them away. Nobody can go from 80% to zero. So the question I ask is, how do you eat an elephant? Oh, my God, it's an elephant. It's huge. You can't eat an elephant in one day. Right. And the way you eat an elephant is you cut it up into little pieces and you eat one piece at a time. That's how we deal with carbohydrate addiction. Mm. We, we own the problem. Remember I said the most difficult part about alcoholism is owning the problem. Once you own the fact that your obesity or diabetes is as a result of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption, we then help you to strategize a stepwise approach to knowing where the carbohydrates are and gradually reducing them one category at a time and removing and replacing those carbohydrates with real food. We climb back across from the endorphin category into the nutritional category. And that's a stepwise approach that may take weeks or months. That's why we don't see instant weight loss, uh, weight loss with, this, uh, uh, with this addiction approach, but it's progressive. So our metric is not uh, is not necessarily immediate weight loss. Our metric is the way we change the endorphin management system. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit more difficult to, to, to measure, but there are absolute measurements on this. The next time in the next, in the next chapter, we will talk about how to remove and replace carbohydrates in your diet. But this was about the carbohydrate addiction model. And that's the first step of the buy-in. Right. And I think just to, Something that became apparent to me when we were having all these discussions before that led up to this idea of actually doing this was that you're not talking here from a theoretical point of view and telling uh, people that are struggling with obesity, this is how, this is the problem and this is how you fix it. I, what I came to understand and realize is that you personally suffered tremendously from, from this very, very addiction. And so you're talking from a very with with personal experiences as, as well as your you know your medical experience you're absolutely right there. and you know what the problem with me is it's not my weight it's not my health it's my emotion management system was deficient and dysfunctional right you know uh, we talked about this before but my parents were very very focused on my success as a human being and 
there wasn't, I wasn't educated or given permission to develop the counterbalance of effective relaxation and emotion management techniques. So when there was a paucity of one and an abundance of the other, and I discovered carbohydrates here in America, I just be, it just became such an easy way to deal with my anxiety, my stress, my depression. And I fell victim to that substance abuse problem. So the issue, and it's with a great degree of humility and exposure of vulnerability that we acknowledge that this is the problem right here. Mm. And, and this just happened to be what was available to me in, in abundance. This could have been nicotine. It could have been heroin. It could have been Percocet. It could have been anything else. It just so happened that coming to this country, there was this abundant push toward carbohydrates in the, in the late 80s. And the food pyramid had become consolidated. So I mean, you were just here at, at, at the perfect time, the perfect storm for that, really. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And we see it now taking over uh, in other countries where carbohydrates are, becoming, are being pushed by the manufacturers mm -hmm. and being sold as being healthy. So we see South Africa becoming the sixth fattest country in the world. We see the Chinese getting fatter when they were one of the healthier, from a, from a weight loss perspective or a weight management perspective, healthier populations. The Russians and the Chinese are still very heavy smokers and they lag behind America by about two, two or three decades in terms of obesity, but it sure as hell is catching up with them. Right. Yeah, well, that's awesome. And I, I, I really feel like people uh, are, are going to feel like they're following not just a story, but your journey as well, because you, you're basically taking us through this whole thing, with your experience in the end as well. So um, it's going to no, be... I think you're, you're absolutely right. It is personal, but it also is true about every single person. I've met with over 20,000 obese and diabetic patients over the last 20 years. And I've never met somebody where this story wasn't true in right. some form or another. Uh, you know, right. when that happens, how it happens, but ultimately the end result is absolutely true. Um, I've never, ever met an obese person or a type two diabetic that had control over their carbohydrate relationship. Mm. So, you know, if somebody's drunk, uh, no matter how much they deny the fact they've been drinking, they've been drinking. Right. Okay. Well, super cool. Now that you're back from your travels, um, we'll try and get, get some of these, uh, next sessions out more frequently.